Hello again. I've been gone for a while. It's Gong Ho. It's April 22nd, 2021. Uh, it's been an incredible time. A lot of changes, I hope. And I'm going to do a series of shows called Law and Disorder and War is a Racket. Today I'm going to concentrate on Law and Disorder. Before I go forward, uh, I want to tell you again something about me, the messenger. I have what you call standing as far as the law and disorder and war. Uh, sometimes people ask me, why did you become a criminal defense lawyer? And to tell you the truth, it took me a while to figure out what, what made me go that way. And uh, I thought back about certain things that had happened to me as a young man, as a man, that actually um, pushed me in that direction, criminal defense. This week, the verdict on the Chauvin case came in. It was a very rare verdict. Rare, very, it's un, really unusual that a police officer would be arrested and tried and convicted of a black person. I know that because I was in the system for over 40 years. And uh, as soon as I started practicing criminal law, one of the things that happened in, in the news, a white officer killed a young teen in a basement in, uh, I think it was Bushwick. And uh, I was working for the Criminal Defense Division at that time, legal aid, and um, they sent out a notice for legal observers. And I went to see what was going on. I went to a demonstration and uh, in front of the 75th precinct, there were four or 500 black people. There was no, there was no media coverage. I was there. And uh, after a while, um, I heard some breaking glass, but it wasn't at the scene of, of the uh, demonstration. And then a few minutes later, I don't know how many squad cars came out of the precinct and charged at the demonstrators. So what I witnessed is a, a police riot. They just like drove the demonstrators away completely and they almost ran me over. <laughs> they came up on a curb. Uh, so that, that was in 1973 actually. I started working at Legal Aid Criminal Defense Division in 1973. White officers killing Black, black young men and black and black and brown young men was a common thing, and they were rarely prosecuted. And if they were, they were acquitted. That was a, that was not not unusual. So um, that was one of the first things my experience about a white officer killing a black teen, nineteen seventy three. But why did I choose criminal defense? Well, first of all, most officers, detectives, prosecutors, and judges are good people and they do good things, they do the right thing. But you have too many that are not. Too many that are sworn to uphold the law and break the law. Sworn to enforce the law and they break the law. Same thing with, you know, I'm talking about police officers district attorneys, judges, whatever it is, there's always the good, the bad, and the ugly. The problem with uh, police officers and detectives, they have a badge and a weapon. So when they break the law, it's different. They can break the law under the color of law and it's very difficult to hold them accountable. So, all right. And this thing about police misconduct, Yes, I could tell you straight hand that blacks and browns are disproportionately targeted 
by the police. I saw it, I represented them, I went against the police and detectives for over 40 years. However, what they do, you know, they do to white people too, believe it or not. And um, of course you do. And I was, when I, now I'm starting to realize why I chose legal, you know, criminal defense. Uh, when I was growing up and I was raised in Nassau County, it was an idyllic community. There were no blacks, no Hispanic, no poor people. Back then, we called them Negroes or whatever. My dad told me when I was very young, if you have an encounter with the police, you'd be very polite to them. Yes, sir. No, sir. Because if you challenge their authority, they're going to get angry real fast. So I had that in the back of my mind. Even so, um, whatever. I went to a, a dance at a church one night to pick up my girlfriend. And I'm just a middle, a middle class white kid, about 16 years old. And I just went there to pick her up. I wasn't going to go into the dance. And all of a sudden I was grabbed and dragged into a room by a cop in uniform that was drunk. And he was actually choking me. I didn't do anything, and I, and, but I was a spunky little guy, or well, whatever. I said, you better stop, my dad's a really powerful person. And his partner pulled him off of me. Uh, they held me, and then um, my father came down. But on the way to the precinct, they had me in the back of a police car. I told the, the officer driving the car that 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 officer that assaulted me was drunk on duty. He was. At the precinct, my father showed up and I was released. That was a, a, a you know pretty traumatic thing to be grabbed, dragged, choked for doing nothing. But he was absolutely drunk. Next thing that happened to me as a teen, I was being stopped by the police quite often, being. I had a junior license, and you might say a hot rod, I don't know, but uh, um, so I got issued three tickets, three speeding tickets. I wasn't speeding. Pled guilty to two, but the third one, I said, look, I'm going to take this to trial, and I did. And I was, uh, I conducted a trial while I was on trial in the um, Massapequa, Massapequa Town Justice Court, representing myself. The officer had a lawyer. As we went a, a trial in front of a judge, uh, I cross-examined the lawyer, I mean the, judge, the, uh, the police officer. He actually got angry during my cross-examination, which wasn't good for him. And I took the stand on my own behalf. I called myself to the stand. And I testified on my own behalf about how it was impossible to go, be going the speed that the officer said I was going in the vehicle I was driving with the number of occupants in the vehicle. And I finished, and his lawyer cross-examined me. And then I told the judge, I have additional witnesses. And he said to me, rest your case. And I thought it was good advice. I rest. And he found me not guilty. And he, he looked over to the first row and he says, is that your mom over there? I said, yes. And, and he said to her, your son's going to be a lawyer. And I said to myself, there's no way I'm going to be a lawyer. All right, that's when I was like 16 years old, my first trial. Uh, a few years later, maybe I was, I was probably 18 or 19, I was at Hofstra University, and a few of my frat brothers and I went down to Wildwood City, New Jersey, to have a good time. And uh, we were in this hotel, and the police barged into our room, no warrant, they arrested us uh, for all kinds of things drinking under the age, burglary, criminal mischief, everything. And they dragged us off and they held us in cages, not cells. We were held, there were four cages in the middle of this big room. 
and they held us in these cages. There was uh, four or five in my cage and two bunks, and they held us there for three days, would not let us make any calls. This is America. And then um, they took us to court, <laughs> and they tried us, non-jury. So far, we had no phone calls. We had no lawyer. They tried us, non-jury. We were convicted. How's that? America. And we were sentenced to, two, uh, to 90 days in jail and a $200 fine. And then finally, they said to us, you can make a phone call now. So I called my dad. And all I had to say to him, Dad, I'm down here with Frank and Jim and Wildwood, and you have to send $600 or we're going to jail. He sent it immediately, and we were released. I was like taken back. I couldn't believe that these things could happen in America. Hold you in a cage for three days, take you to trial, convict you. That had a really big effect on me as a young man. Then, um, what happened is I graduated Massapequa High School in 61. I graduated Hofstra University in 66. I enlisted in the Marine Corps in 66. Uh, went to Paris Island, but I also went to OCS and I became an officer. I volunteered for Vietnam. I went to Vietnam as an infantry officer. And I'd say maybe, uh, maybe my eighth or ninth month as an infantry officer during the monsoon season. Uh, one day we were moving along, uh, going through a, a rice paddy that was uh, basically flooded by the monsoon. But as we were moving, we captured the two NVA soldiers that were in the bottom of a, a bomb crater. I don't know why they were there. Um, we didn't kill them. Uh, we took them prisoner, and we moved on into a village. And in the village was a Buddhist temple. It was a big Buddhist temple, thick, you know, brick walls. And I, and that's where I put my headquarters, and I put my Marines in, uh, around the, the village, or, or a portion of the village. And while I was in the Buddhist temple, uh, this Marine officer walked in, a captain who I've never seen before. He was looking for me, and found me, and he said to me, um, are you Lieutenant Janini? I said, yes. He said, this is for you, and he handed me this big red book, uh, you know, hard copy, and I said, what is that, sir? He says, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Why am I getting it? He says, well, you've been assigned to defend this Marine at a court-martial, but I'm not a lawyer. He said, it doesn't matter. He's not entitled to a lawyer. So in the combat zone, they convened a court-martial, a field court-martial, in a Catholic church that had been bombed. The whole roof was missing. I had to defend a Marine in a court-martial. And one of my friends, another lieutenant, was assigned to prosecute. So here I am, I'm on trial in Vietnam, I'm mean, conducting the defense in Vietnam. I was really upset about this. I mean, I couldn't believe that they would let me defend this guy and I'm not a lawyer. So I was looking through the big red book before the trial and the Marine was guilty. He went a wall and he assaulted what we call a rear echelon mother in the rear. Now he was facing seven years in a bad conduct discharge. And I had no defense. But I'm going through the book and I find something called mitigating circumstances and it could be character evidence. Well, in other words, yes, he did something wrong. But there are other things about him that you should, so you should treat him differently. So, I knew this Marine. I knew he was a brave Marine. I saw him under fire. <sighs> we were on a hill, surrounded by the NVA, 
we had a very small LZ, one chopper at a time, and this Marine was running our LZ. My bunker was nearby. I saw him under fire, bringing in the choppers, supervising the loading and unloading. And then one day, he got on the chopper and he left. And he was gone for a week and he came back. So I knew this Marine, I saw him. So I went to see the Sergeant Major and um, and wanted to know what he knew about this young Marine. He said, that Marine, he's already been awarded a bronze star for bravery and I'm writing him up for another one. So I said, would you come to the court martial and testify? He said, yes, of course. So I lined up some character witnesses for this Marine. I didn't put him on the stand and that was my defense. Yes, he left the battalion for a week. Before he left, he was doing something that was so incredible. He's, a, he's lucky he survived because I saw Marines jump off that chopper, the replacements, and get killed. I saw that happen. They ran a few yards and they were dead. One of them was right there, right there, right near me. He fell down right there, two feet away from me. He was running towards my bunker. I watched him die. And he, you know, the next chapter we put him on the top and he went back home, dead. Anyhow, so we had the court martial and he was convicted. The gunny sergeant, uh, sergeant major testified and some other character witnesses and the verdict was um, not seven years, it was one year, and there was no bad conduct discharge. Then the verdict, uh, the sentence was reduced, but he had to do his time at, they called the Long Bin Prison. We called it the LBJ prison. And the time that he did at the prison didn't count toward his time uh, in Vietnam. But I lost, but it was, a victory. Didn't get seven years and didn't get a bad conduct discharge. So, in the end, I really liked that. So all these things that happened to me before I was a lawyer. Got out of the Marine Corps and decided I want to go to law school. So that's what I did. Went to law school on a GI Bill. Graduated in 1973. And I walked into a legal aid office in Manhattan. I said, I want a job. They hired me right there, criminal defense division. Boom. Course, small, you know, small course and substance and procedure. And they put you right in the courtroom. And there I was. And I'm in the drug part. And the Rockefeller laws have just come into uh, effect. And the cops are out there, the white cops, and they're busting mostly black and brown and poor white people and they're bringing them to court. And almost all of them are facing life. How's that? They're facing life. Because they had, or well, they claim to have had an ounce of cocaine or an ounce of morphine or an ounce of methadone. They're facing a mandatory minimum of 15 to life. And that was my intro. So, what I'm saying, um, some of you know me, some of you don't, but maybe there's new people out there. I have standing. I've been in there. I've been in the trenches, the war trenches. Yes, we had trenches, foxholes and bunkers and things like that. And I've been in the trenches in the court system up against the worst of the worst. And yes, I had family in the mafia. Yes, I represented people in the mafia. I represented big drug dealers. I represented murderers. I did all of those things. I went against bad cops and bad detectives and bad DAs. It, they did such things that were incredible that if you told people what they did, they wouldn't believe you. I have the proof of all of these things. I'll give you one example, and maybe I told you this already. While I was uh, in my private practice, 
I got involved in the boxing business and I was actually managing some pro fighters and one of my fighters' brothers got arrested for murder. You know, Miguel Blackie Hernandez was the fighter. His brother Fernando got arrested for murder. murder. He murdered, he did. He killed the drug dealer. And I went to see him and you know, he, he told me, you know, Mr. Giannini, I, I did this. He's indicted for murder. And uh, getting ready to go to trial. And I'm going to all the discovery and I'm looking at the witnesses' statements and I've never seen anything like this. I never saw such incredibly damning statements from two teenagers. So I told them, if this is it, you, you can't go to trial, you're dead. And he said, work me out a plea. So I did. Manslaughter, 8 to 16, he's ready to take the plea. The judge knows, the DA knows, we go back to court. I mean, I go down, talk to him, he's ready. I come back before the court and the DA says, we're, we're, where we are, we're drawing the plea. That, that never, I've never had that happen to me before or after. You made a deal in front of the judge. Judge got very angry. So, okay, got to go to trial. Put the case down for trial. Now I got to do some work, so I'm going to go see the witnesses. I go see the witnesses with, you know, with an investigator. And I start to talk to one of them, and guess what? He can't even speak a full sentence. He and his brother are severely autistic. And, and I said, and his mom was there, I said, then who made these statements? And one of the boys said, Detective Medina. I said, what? The detective on the case, Detective Medina, had written and typed out, actually typed out their statements. And they weren't true. These boys, you know, I felt sorry for them, this mom. So I know now that the statements that they gave me are not true. That Detective Medina, the detective assigned to the case, wrote out or actually typed out these statements. So go back to court. And we have to have a hearing now to decide what evidence is admissible. For example, the lineup evidence, and I get accused of tampering of witnesses. So we're having a hearing, a long hearing, an accusation against me and my investigator and my client's brother. And at the same time, the admissibility of the, hear of the ID, the lineup. So they put one of these kids on the stand and they're examining him, the DA, and he asked him, were you taken to the precinct? Yes. Did you see a lineup? Yes. Did you pick out a number? Yes. Was it this number? Yes. Why did you pick out that number? And the kid says, under oath, in front of the judge, well, Detective Medina told me to pick it out. Oops. End of case. Not yet, because the officers have to testify the officers that conducted the lineup have to come in. And so I start to cross-examine them, and they don't know what's going on. They've been out in the hallway. And I start asking them questions. And one of the questions was, did you give any witness or witnesses any money? And guess what they said? The first detective, yes. I just threw that out there. I said, how much? He said, we gave him $50. Why would you give them $50? Well, we gave him $50 for lunch at, you know, at Burger King. Whoops. Next detective on the stand, Medina. Now, he tries to speak to the detective getting off the stand and the judge says, no, you can't do that. Get on the stand. I start to examine Medina and I ask him, was any money paid? to the witnesses, and he says, yes. How much? I don't know. The case is over. They, Medina, 
the officer, I mean, the lead homicide detective on the case, framed the killer. He framed the killer. Uh, the judge looked over at him like, you are a piece of shit. Got off the stand, and the judge, after a while, a few minutes, said, looked down at my client and said, Mr. Hernandez, I know you're guilty, <laughs> but I'm dismissing this case, and I don't want to see your face again. And it was dismissed. So you had a detective that actually framed the killer. So the killer was never found guilty. The case was dismissed. That was the end of the detective, too, believe it or not because we had a special prosecutor back then that went after dirty cops and dirty detectives and dirty lawyers and dirty judges, and he was under investigation, and he had to resign in disgrace. And one day on my way to the 83rd Precinct, I saw him, and he was known, it was known, well, that he was crooked, that he was involved in the drug trade. It was known, and he really was. And he walks up to me and he says to me, Joe, Joe, you didn't have to do that to me. Call me Joe. I said, John, you thought you were above the law. You weren't above the law. And he says to me, well, I'm doing pretty good. I own three Burger Kings. <laughs> oh boy, all right. I'm just about out of time. I'm laying the foundation for what I'm going to continue with law and disorder. Uh, I'm going to start out with, I guess, the Chauvin verdict and move on to something that happened out here. And then later on about pulling out of Afghanistan. Uh, I have a lot of, well, I have some Marine friends that were there and some of their friends were killed that were there. I'll be talking about that later on. All right, get a shot of Eden. Eden, come here, get up. Come on, come on, get up, get up. Come on, girl. <laughs>